Before I start the episode, I just want to give a brief content warning. I'm going to discuss homophobic hate crimes in relation to the film that I'm discussing today. So if that in any way is going to affect you negatively, then I won't mind if you skip this episode. Hello! My name is Amber and this is You Look Like a Badger, a podcast where I discuss queer cinema. I'm very happy that I managed to keep this up. I'm doing a whole second episode, so that's nice. And the film that we are discussing for February under the theme Queering the Heart, where I'm going to discuss queer romance films, is Weekend. Can you remember what you wanted to happen? Mm, no. What about when I took your top off? No. I wanted to lick your pits. I got a thing about pits. Come on, lift up. No. Let me have a see. No. Come on. No. Why not? Because it's weird. It's not weird. It's easy. Let me have a look. Weekend is a romantic drama that came out in 2011, directed by Andrew Haig, starring Tom Cullen and Chris New. It follows Russell, played by Cullen, as he has a short-lived relationship with the more confidently queer Glenn, exploring the intimacy that can be shared between two men, if only for a short period of time. Slow-moving and comfortably claustrophobic, this film tackles gay male identity and its relationship to sex through its various diatribes on poignant issues, slowly building a romance that is doomed from the beginning but continues to burn hard and strong. The naturalistic dialogue invites the audience into the world, allowing them to feel comfortable whilst ever so gently reminding them that this relationship is unsustainable. This film won 24 different awards, including the Evening Standard British Film Award for Best Screenplay and the Audience Award at South by Southwest Film Festival. It has a 95% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and a 3.9 on Letterboxd. So all around, this film was very well received. It even managed to get a Criterion release. Now, a segment I started in the last episode was one where I would read the top reviews that are currently on Letterboxd. So I'm going to continue with that. This time around, they are less funny, mainly because the <laughs> the subject matter of the film is significantly more serious. So whilst I do like these reviews, they are less humorous <laughs> than the ones I used last time. Sally Jane Black says, It's painful to watch. Their relationship is shaped by their environment in ways that confine them. And you know what? That's very true, I think. I am going to discuss more in detail, but it's a very compact film. And I mean, you know early on the way their personalities are just so different. It means that they are also very compacted in and it kind of spells doom from the beginning. Another user, Michael, says, Weekend seems to be very interested, if not obsessed, with the idea of heteronormativity and how straight people ignore gay people until they assimilate into the heteronormative society. Assimilation or isolation, those are the two options. Now, I'd like to think that we'd got more (laughs) hopeful since 2011, but definitely around this time. In the UK, gay marriage still wasn't legal and the way we spoke about gay people has just vastly changed with the advent of the internet. It's kind of my opinion that this film is kind of amazing that it existed when it did. I think sometimes we take for granted like how much LGBTQ plus issues have been put into the mainstream. There just wasn't an avenue for that, really, at this time. And And it was only like 11 years ago. Yeah, it's kind of depressing. (laughs) So like I said before, there's generally a lot more serious about the reviews and the way critics have discussed this film in comparison to The Favourite. And it seems to be because it tackles the gay experience head on as its thesis rather than it being a feature of the story. The Favourite wasn't about queerness, it was about the power struggle. Whereas this film is pretty much wholly about discussing gay identity in relation to society. It includes very real topics of homophobia at its most violent. I will go into more detail about that. But now is when I give my spoiler warning. So if you haven't seen the film, go and watch it. (laughs) So what people may notice about this film, just in general, is that it is very naturalistic. And it could very much fall into the category of mumblecore. So I'm going to explain what mumblecore is, but first I just want to talk about the naturalistic part of it. I think the goal of having more naturalistic dialogue, of having the characters feel real and having the conversations be a bit awkward and all over the place, really grounds 
the what can be at times very philosophical and in another form possibly pretentious conversations about gay topics so for example gay marriage is discussed and being gay in public is discussed and gay sex is discussed and i feel like if it was very scripted it could come across as very didactic very preachy whereas in this film it feels like it's just two people having a conversation that's not to say it's not scripted at all i imagine there was definitely a script for this but having it feel less scripted makes these conversations more palatable probably more accessible for people who know nothing about queerness at all whether it's accessible to straight people i'm not really sure and um, there's a lot of gay sex in this film so <laughs> Um, that might alienate a lot of straight people. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't feel too high-minded even if it is discussing very serious topics. So I'm going to give like a quick definition of mumblecore. This is from an article on the site Art Touches Art. What the article says is, as an indie subgenre, mumblecore's point of difference was its minimalism. Poor sound quality, low budget aesthetics, non-actors, jumpy handheld camera movements, are all suggestive of a surge towards a DIY movement. Mumblecore emphasised a homegrown culture that was slowly evolving at the start of the century and that has now progressed much further than the rudimentary techniques of these initial projects. Mumblecore is meant to feel very homemade. I mean, it is kind of ironic that a lot of Mumblecore is actually made by very rich people <laughs> um, and not indie directors um they are meant to feel as though anyone could have made them even if a lot of very rich people made them within the context of this film i think what it does is makes the world feel less alien very cozy claustrophobic at times but accessible you know whether that's a good thing is very subjective i think there are times when this film is quite alienating but in being very naturalistic fitting within the mumblecore genre is it trying to appeal to a straight audience i mean like i said lots and lots of gay sex happens in this film so probably not accessibility in terms of behind the camera maybe this was trying to start a trend of gay cinema that felt homegrown and not very like out of the way and out of touch with what was happening in the real world. I think it can also be argued that in doing this, it's trying to, I mean, it is ironic that this film seems to be trying to bring gay stories down to earth. The only gay stories that seemed to be in the mainstream, at least at the time, were gay tragedies, and they were often made specifically to be Oscar nominated. An article in Junkie, there's a good article called We Deserve to See Queer Romance That Doesn't End in Death and Misery, argues that traditionally, the only movies brave enough to tackle gay stories were big prestige Oscar nominated films or art house indies. And due to the nature of those genres, they tend to skew towards tragedy by default. You don't see a rom-com winning best picture, but you also don't see gay leads in a rom-com. I mean, the question comes up again, the one that I was trying to and probably failed to argue in the previous episode. That being, is this story considered a tragedy? I personally don't think so. Again, do I know what a tragedy is? Vaguely, <laughs> but not enough to explain it right now. I think sometimes when discussing queer films we get very caught up on a happy ending and happy endings are just very subjective and very contextual so in this film whilst yes russell and glenn don't end up together does that mean that the ending is sad or that the ending is unfulfilling unsatisfying i personally don't think so i think if you go into a film called weekend and you read the synopsis of the film where it says this is a short-lived romance that only lasts for a weekend and you are surprised by the ending that it actually ends the way it says it's going to i mean i don't know if you can be very critical of that i mean jamming a happy ending into this story would feel unsatisfying to me i don't think it would work as well I think the point of this is that the film is a small moment of intimacy, it is a weekend. We are in an enclosed space of the weekend. We are in an enclosed space of the flat and we are in the enclosed space of their relationship. It has a beginning and an end. And the fact that it ends doesn't make the relationship less happy, less fulfilling. 
It just makes it exist. And for queer cinema, that on its own can be enough. So in an interview with the director, he says that he wanted it to feel like a contained little world that the story could live in. He wanted it to feel like lots of people have lived there in the past and that Russell was trying to bring his own life into that apartment. And that is one of the strengths of the film. This world that we see of Russell and Glenn feels very lived in, even if it is very enclosed. It feels as though people come and go, even if we don't necessarily see them. The director goes on to say, I actually don't see them as a relationship, but I feel like they were so fundamental to each other. Russell's life will be infinitely better through meeting Glenn, but that doesn't mean that they would actually have worked as a couple. We all go through life meeting people, whether they're lovers or friends, and we don't necessarily have to have them in our lives for very long. But they leave a really, really important mark. They change you fundamentally. You could only have been with them for a weekend. Those relationships are as important as long-term relationships. And honestly, I think that's kind of important. I think it's quite funny that the ending kind of plays on the romantic comedy airport ending, where one person rushes to the airport with the intent of stopping them from leaving. And I think it's Glenn that says, is this like Notting Hill? And I think that's important. The film acknowledges the romance genre, and in doing that, it kind of points out how gay people have just been excluded from this genre in the mainstream. But yet it references and it subverts this ending because Russell doesn't run there to stop Glenn from going. He runs there presumably to express his feelings. Part of the conversation that they have where Russell is expressing his feelings is obscured by the train noises, which I think is very funny. It's as if Haig is just not allowing us to encroach on their intimate moment. It's respecting Russell and Glenn's privacy, particularly because we learn that Glenn just doesn't do relationships and he doesn't like intimate feelings he doesn't really like the idea of a boyfriend so I think it's nice that Russell and Glenn get like a split second of privacy where they can express emotions where Russell's declaration of love is just for Glenn and it's not for us and for the first time in the film we see them kiss in public which is something that Russell has not wanted to do and for good reason and I'm glad that the film kept this in because after they kiss they're harassed they get homophobic harassment there's a wolf whistle and someone shouts gay boy it's quite quiet so you have to be listening out for it but it does happen and i think it's good that the film doesn't invalidate russell's fears of homophobia and homophobic violence it's good that the film doesn't try to paint homophobia as an irrational fear, which some gay films have done. So sometimes they'll frame it as though the gay person in the film is irrational for not coming out to people. It'll often be the trope of the hidden relationship where one person in the relationship doesn't want to be out. They can't come out to their parents. They can't come out to people around them. It's a secret. And often those characters are framed as irrational and manipulative. And it's quite annoying to see, actually, because being in the closet is quite hard. And it's made even harder if you're made to feel guilty and irrational for your legitimate fears of experiencing homophobia. So I'm, I'm glad that the film kept this in. I think it's honest. And then you start to kiss my ears, and then you kiss my neck, and then you kiss my... And then he kissed my hand. A major part of this film is its discussion and depiction of sex and intimacy. The film hinges on the believability of the relationship. Even if it is short, even if it doesn't last very long, it's the believability that Glenn and Russell have some kind of connection and intimacy and how a lot of it hinges on sex. We get a very strict dichotomy of how gay men can express themselves sexually in public and the way straight men can express themselves sexually in public. So a very obvious scene in the film is when Russell is on his lunch break and he hears his co-workers talking about, I think they're talking about someone fingering someone else. And it is just quite hilariously sad how gay men just can't talk like that out loud. I mean, whether we want them to, who knows, but the um, juxtaposition is set up where Glenn and Russell don't feel comfortable hugging outside Russell's apartment, but straight men can talk like this openly in public without really any repercussions at all. Early on in the film, 
you kind of get the idea that Russell just feels very isolated. Like he has his straight friends and they're accepting of him, but they don't ever really discuss queerness. And some of that is because of Russell. He doesn't seem that comfortable discussing it with straight people. But you also have to question why he doesn't feel that comfortable discussing it with his straight friends. The film is interesting in the way it uses nudity. We see Russell and Glenn in sexual and non-sexual situations where they're just naked. We just see naked men. (laughs) We just see naked male bodies and they're often not necessarily treated as sexual objects. They're usually just there. So Russell has a bath. He has several baths actually, which is quite strange. I've never seen that many baths be taken by one person in a film and we see Glenn the morning after he's just walking around Russell's flat naked and these can be contrasted to the very explicit sex scenes just in the way that I think nudity in the film is used as a signifier of the character's comfortability where they feel safe to be vulnerable so we see it during sex and we see it when Russell's in the bath and we see it when Glenn's walking around I mean it's also a signifier of Glenn being the more confident and candid one about sex. He has like a tape recorder where he records his partners after sex, asking them different questions about how the sex goes. So not only is sex a major thing visually in the film, it is a discussion point. Glenn talks about how gay people can't talk about sex in public, and that's just true. He straight up says it, they can't talk about it in public. In terms of intimacy, the film seems to suggest that Glenn specifically seeks out sex as a way to be intimate, that he can't have a boyfriend. Um, and we're made to believe that the reason he can't have a boyfriend is because he's been hurt in the past. Even even though he explicitly, he does say that he's not heartbroken about his ex who cheated on him and then very shortly after experienced a homophobic hate crime, but they can't be unconnected at all. Otherwise they wouldn't have been mentioned in the film, would they? So we get the idea that Glenn can't be intimate in the way that Russell can. Both Glenn and Russell have their shortcomings in terms of how they express intimacy. So Russell can't really be gay in public. He doesn't like holding hands or hugging in front of what could potentially be violent straight people. And Glenn can't have a boyfriend for a similar reason. Even if he won't admit it, he seems to have experienced a upsetting event and just doesn't want to relive that again. Whether Glenn's a hypocrite for decrying that gay people can't talk about sex and then not being able to discuss how he truly feels. I think Glenn's situation is very understanding. It's just, in terms of a romantic story, I think even if you know where the story is going, you witness the intimacy of the relationship and you you want them to somehow work out, even if it's not necessarily realistic. I think there are parts of us that just want it to fit the romantic comedy mold, just wants a happy ending for these two because we hear their pain and we understand it. It'd be easy to understand why you'd reject intimacy if you'd experienced such pain. We just want them to be happy and we think this relationship would make them happy and it does for a brief moment. The film's very good at towing the line of what intimacy means. It deliberately defies the idea that intimacy is relegated to a long-term relationship and I think that's pretty great. I don't really see the point. Um, You know, I don't think it would... um change anything. Why don't I pretend to be your dad and you can, <laughs> you can come out to me? That is so weird. Just ignore the fact that we've just had sex. I don't think I can ignore the fact that we've just had try. sex. <laughs> okay. Dad. I've got something that I need to tell you. What's that? I'm gay. Mm. I like guys, not girls. Well, you know what, son? It doesn't matter to me. And I love you just the same. And guess what? What? I couldn't be more proud of you than if you were the first man on the moon. So in an interview with Andrew Haig, he said this of Russell. Russell feels like if he wants to live a gay life, 
he has to turn away from the rest of his life. And I don't think that's unrelatable. I think there are lots of messages that <laughs> implicitly say, if you want to be happy and normal, then straightness is key. And I think a very conservative, liberal idea is, of course we don't hate gay people, just don't do the gay in front of us, which is not a good compromise because we exist in the world and queerness is part of us. So having to hide it away, even if it would make our lives a little bit easier, would be excruciating in terms of just existing because it would mean that you're lying all the time. So I don't think it's unrelatable to feel like that. The film explores key parts of the gay identity in that way. So we see the importance of like nightclub culture and gay bars and kind of see like a glimpse of cruising. I found an article kind of discussing the history of gay bars and uh, it says, I'm gonna quote it directly. Um, it says, it's hard to overstate the importance of the gay bar within the LGBTQ rights movement over the past couple hundred years. These bars have served as a safe place for the LGBTQ community to be together, to mingle and simply exist as their true selves. This film is able to show the ways that queer people have to hide themselves and how they have relegated spaces, but often these spaces are underwhelming. You know, Russell says that he hate, he kind of hates the gay bar, but it's the only way that he's able to express a part of himself, that there aren't spaces in public to be gay. Glenn, as a character, is very loud about his opinions on queerness. He's very political, very different from Russell, who is quite happy to hide away in places that he hates. If it means that he doesn't have to cause a fuss, if it means that he doesn't have to uproot his life, he's quite happy to remain vaguely unhappy if he doesn't have to create drama in his life. And honestly, honestly, coming from... <laughs> Honestly, it's just, it's very relatable. It just is. It's not politically correct, but it is relatable. I would just, I would just prefer if there would be no fuss and everyone could just calm down and I could, <laughs> and people would just stop bothering me. That would be nice. Um, but yeah, Glenn is like the complete opposite and honestly, kind of a nightmare to be around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he he will start an argument in a straight bar about the ways he's allowed to express himself in public. The scene specifically is him talking about a sexual encounter that he has and this man pulls him up on it <laughs> and he's just arguing in public <laughs> and it's, it's, it's very awkward and, and kind of a nightmare to be around if you're a quiet person who doesn't want to start drama. And I think Glenn is a very admirable character but he's not He's not the character I relate to in this situation. I think it's interesting to discuss whether uh, we approve of the way Russell is critical of heteronormativity, because he definitely is, but he's not in the way that Glenn is. He's able to have a conversation with Glenn about queerness in the comfort of his own flat, where it is just a discussion and probably won't lead to violence, but he wouldn't be able to do what Glenn does, which is to provoke arguments in public with straight people, regardless of whether the situation could turn violent. And it could, like I said earlier, it is discussed in the film how Glenn's ex was assaulted for being gay in public. And that kind of hangs over the way these two characters exist. The violence is there, even if it's off screen, even if it's not shown, it is there and the threat of it. The threat of it is there in the straight bar when Glenn is arguing, like it just is. It's very sad to think about, but it is. I think it's interesting to show the two characters disagreeing on queer issues. I love that. I love that these two characters have very different opinions on whether gay people should assimilate or whether they should go off and do their own thing. I think it's good to have um, gay people find each other and have positive experiences with one another, and they do in this film, but show that gay people aren't a hive mind and that they have different opinions and those opinions are complicated and they're informed by their own specific lives, how they live and the way that they were raised. It's very good that the film shows the ways that they had similar experiences. So they talk about coming out and early sexual experiences and watching porn and the way that these informed their identities. So, does this film look like a badger? Now, in my personal opinion, I love this film, like a lot. I think it's very intimate and very candid 
very well acted and just very relatable for me personally. With that being said, it is very slow and a little bit plotless. So unlike The Favourite, which is very tight and sharp and constantly moving and very thrilling, the slow nature of the film could be very alienating for audiences, which is not to say that you won't like it, but some people just don't want to watch a film about two people falling in love and then breaking up <laughs> and not being together. They might view it as pointless. I personally don't think that, but I think that criticism is valid. I think some people watch romance films with the purpose of seeing the two people end up together and they don't. I think for straight people, it could be very alienating because of how explicit it is about sex. It shows the two characters having sex frequently and there's no happy ending which people on Twitter hate. They hate gay films that don't have happy endings. What would I recommend if you enjoyed this film? So the first thing that I'd recommend is a film called Duck Butter. This is not as well rated as Weekend is but it's a film that I really love and it has a similar kind of plot. So the conceit of the film is these two women decide to have their whole relationship over the course of 24 hours, at which point they will break up. So it kind of explores the way that queer women's relationships move at a different pace than everyone else's. I think it's very interesting. I think it's very underrated. I think it's rated far too low on Letterboxd. <laughs> I really like the film and I think more people should see it. If you enjoyed Andrew Haig's style specifically and the way he tells stories, I would recommend the series Looking. I think, I don't know how many seasons there are, I think there's two or three, but it's about gay men, the lives of three gay men living in San Francisco. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I'm going to keep this up, I think. I've done two months of it now, so... Yeah, I think I'm going to keep doing it, so that's good. <laughs> Next month's theme is going to be... <laughs> uh, I love coming up with names for these. Next month's theme is ladies, ladies, ladies. I'm going to be discussing films about queer women. That's what March is going to be dedicated to. I think it's the 8th of March is International Women's Day. I'm going to dedicate March to a film about queer women. It will not be out on the 8th of March because I'm not that quick. <laughs> I have lots of things to do outside of this podcast, so yeah, it will it will come out in March, but it won't be on the 8th of March. Apologies. <laughs> if you'd like to stay updated, make sure that you follow me on Twitter, which is at like a badger pod, and follow me on Spotify, which is probably where you're listening to this, or on YouTube. You can subscribe to the, my YouTube channel because I'm uploading all of the podcasts as videos as well, if you'd like to watch it along, the, <laughs> if you want. If you enjoy the way I discuss films, you can find my writing at ambercanwalk.com. I recently wrote a short review of Petit Maman, uh, which came out last year and was a film that I really loved. So you can read that if you'd like. If you enjoy me in general and you'd like to support me financially, you can donate to my coffee, which I'll put in the show notes. All of my sources are also in the show notes if you wanted to read some more. Thank you again for listening and I hope to see you in March. Bye!